Well, it's obviously particularly nice to, to be here on this occasion. The SMI has, has done me a, a great honor with this award, and I thank the Society, and I also thank the Irish Research Council very much indeed. So, who needs a passport? Well, actually, I needed one on the 24th of June, 2016 on which date I became rather enthusiastic about my Irish roots. It was quite a sudden thing, actually, and I invite you to speculate about the motivation. The result, the result in any case, is that I acquired for the first time an Irish passport. And since I already have a UK passport, I am, I suppose, doubly invested in all those discussions about the Irish border. You certainly know the language. The border should be frictionless, not hard. There must be a backstop. Historical sensitivities should be respected, uh, the peace process protected. Well, as it happens, quite a lot of that language was very familiar to me. I researched for several years in Southeast Europe and subsequently, indeed currently, in the endlessly fascinating meta-regions through which Europe shades into West Asia. So I have some form in the matter of borders. You can't research in these territories without engaging very directly with them. But you have to be careful. If you make borders a primary focus, you foreground division by definition. And the dangers of that are twofold that you will overstate the differences between spaces and that you will overstate the unity within spaces. The two go together, of course. I hope in this lecture to nuance the relation between borders and spaces. Nations, cultures, and polities invariably exist in a contrapuntal relation. Nations, after all, are not only political. Conversely, cultures are also political. And music is an essential, and I stress essential, strand of the counterpoint. There's nothing surprising or novel in any of that. Yet the institutionalized discourse of music history often proceeds as though nations and cultures march in step. And by the discourse of music history, I mean not just published scholarship, but also official research policy and teaching curricula. In his lecture, The Concept of Time, Martin Heidegger reminded us that historical references can only function within discourses, and that our inquiry should therefore start at the discourse level rather than with the references themselves. We need, in other words, to understand the nature of the discourse before we do history. With that in mind, it's reasonable to ask just when and where the discourse of music history was nationalized. 18th century music historians, of whom there were quite a few, did not, on the whole, fragment general histories into national narratives. But in the 19th century, an idea gained ground among German critics and historians in particular that the musical culture of a nation expresses and embodies its national spirit. A German national canon was institutionalized across that century and into the next and in several stages. Composer biographies, conservatory syllabuses, collected editions, national histories. This narrative inevitably marginalized other cultures, but chauvinism is contagious, and in due course, comparable national narratives were instituted even in those regions that had been marginalized, so that they in turn could marginalize others. As new nations were carved out of empires, they were validated by proprietorial cultural histories even if these were not always able to smooth over the manufactured quality of the nationhood in question, nor indeed to resist what we might call the chauvinism within. One example. I hope you'll be able to see these overheads. <coughs> um, this landmark history of music in Yugoslavia intended to set the cultural seal on a new nation state, that's the second Yugoslavia, comprises de facto three separate national histories, Croatian, Slovenian, and Serbian, hence the three authors. As for the three poorer republics, Montenegro, Bosnia, Macedonia, they were covered in a few exiguous 
paragraphs in the introduction, roughly a page for each in a book of over 700 pages, the chauvinism within. National history suppressed not just minoritarian identities, but cultural commonalities that span political borders. When I was writing my book on the Balkans, I was struck by how many native musicologists knew everything there is to know about their own traditions, but could tell me little about the music of their immediate neighbors. This lecture is a protest against that kind of exclusivity and parochialism, however unwitting. It addresses the commonalities <coughs> that arise from shared cultural substrata, from common imperial legacies, from nationalist agendas in composition or <coughs> practice, I'll explain that paradox later, and from the lure of modern Europe. I'll go through those four categories <coughs> one by one, beginning with what I called shared cultural substrata. There is a musical culture in Southeast Europe that remains rooted to the spot. These repertories, the traditional ritual musics associated with pre-modern rural societies, tap into cultural layers that are buried deep. Yet if the relevant musics have remained in their places, those places have become increasingly isolated. Typically they've been left high and dry, islands of local culture marooned by the rising tides of modernity. They've been oblivious to the politics of nationhood, though not impervious to its manipulative design. My case study is the traditional polyphonic music of Greco-Albania, Greco-Albanian Epirus, that's just one is here. Uh, this is Epirus in, in Ottoman times and no political border. A later border would draw the major uh, Ottoman city, Yanana, and also, by the way, over in the east, uh, Salonika, would draw them into the fold of modern Greece, as you can see in that uh, later map. Now, I'd like to show you a video I recorded some years ago in a domestic setting in Permeti, a town in southern Albania. I apologize for the quality of this video. It's got corrupted a bit somehow, but I think you'll, you'll be able to hear the, the style. UNESCO labels that music uh, Albanian folk ezo polyphony. <clears throat> but it should not surprise anyone to know that the same music can be heard across the political border in Greece, only the language is different, which has not stopped Greek and Albanian scholars from constructing two uh, mutually incompatible national traditions around it, returning it respectively to Hellenic and Illyrian pasts. Actually, this is documented in a uh, an, an extensive piece by Nitsiakos and Mansos. Music has to belong to someone to have an identity, it seems, and as political borders force cultural communities either side of a line, invented histories validate the new spaces. There is, however, a complicating factor. There may be linguists in this room 
who have noticed that the language in that clip was neither Greek nor Albanian. It was, in fact, Aromanian, an Eastern Romance language, and the people you saw in the <coughs> clip were Vlachs, who do not belong quite within either of our two national narratives, but are an ethnic and linguistic minority within each of them. Traditionally, they were a transhuman people who moved freely across the political border. They did not need passports. Now, Vlachs have been officially a Romanian minority since the First Balkan War, which means that a third national narrative, Romanian, is also involved. The, the Vlachs have been forced in between by these three national narratives, and in my field work, I encountered highly defensive self-representations. They often find themselves impossibly caught between antithetical stories about their own cultural identities. UNESCO's Intangible Heritage Project, however well-intentioned, actually perpetuates the distorting effects of such national narratives. Repertories are labeled by nations quite simply because submissions are prepared by nations. And I do need to emphasize that the eparotic example is not unique. I could easily retell my story of traditional polyphonies in the mountain regions bordering Georgia and the Russian Federation, for example, where I'm currently researching. To deconstruct these national narratives is a job for scholarship. And I want to be clear about why it's important to do this work. It's not about reifying traditional cultures in a spirit of nostalgia, presenting them as lyrical and stable and somehow free of internal contradiction. You don't do traditional cultures any favors at all by this kind of idealization. You respect them more by critiquing them, actually. Nor is it about therapy. This music has no real capacity to glue back together cultures that have been split apart by nationalism. What it is about is getting the history as right as we can. It's by getting the history right that we create a bulwark against the abuse of the past by the powerful, or to put it another way, the abuse of culture by politics. If there are musical cultures in Southeast Europe that are rooted to the spot, there are also musical cultures that move freely and spread quickly, not least due to the shared, markedly multicultural imperial pasts of these and neighboring territories. This is the second of the four categories I mentioned earlier, common imperial legacies. Southeast Europe was a site of intersecting Venetian, Habsburg, Romanov, and Ottoman empires, within which mobility and migration were endemic. My case study will focus on the two eastern empires, the Romanov and the Ottoman, and strictly speaking, it will take us beyond Southeast Europe. But let me offer the very briefest of comments on the other two empires. I want to signal, but not really to discuss, three books dealing with music in Dalmatia here. Dalmatia is now part of Croatia, and uh, our first book locates it fairly and squarely within a Croatian national history. Any composer born there is part of Andris's story, and so too is any composer who migrated there. But there are alternatives to this national narrative. Our second book looks at Dalmatia, specifically Istria, as an outpost of the Venetian Empire. It actually comes in a book series dealing with Venetian culture. Venice, after all, controlled this territory for almost four centuries and imposed on it the cultural forms of empire. As for our third book, the most recent, well, the title tells its own story. This is not about the nation, nor even the empire, but about migration and mobility, surely subjects for our times. Now, an equally brief word on the Eastern Habsburg Empire, the heartland of Mitteleuropa. Within the vast reaches of the Habsburg Empire, Networking between centers and peripheries was so endemic as to call those very terms into question. 
Typically, musicians traveling from center to periphery would become the property of the periphery and a part of would-be national cultures in Southeast Europe. Look behind the native spellings and you'll find that many of the national pioneers were actually Czechs or Germans. But that doesn't mean that peripheries were no more than dim reflections of the light beamed out by charismatic centers. Migrants from the periphery settling in the center would construct complementary narratives of nostalgia and acculturation, and this promoted a genuine dialogue between their two homelands. Networking was all, and as Helmut Luce and others have demonstrated, it was partly thanks to networking that concert programs all over Mitteleuropa were markedly similar and usually broadly conservat conservative. This even in the heyday of nation-state politics in the late 19th century. But my case study, as I say, takes us to the two Eastern empires. It concerns touring opera troupes in the 19th century, closely networked within each empire, but also on occasion crossing from one to the other. If nothing else, this may uh, help brush up your geography a bit. Let's start with a remote corner of the Russian Empire at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries. This is a map of present-day Ukraine, and the historic region of Podolia is more or less there. At the time, it was part of the Russian Empire, and before that, it had been part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. There was nothing untoward about the fact that Count Josef <coughs> August Ilinski, a key figure in the politics of the Third Polish Partition, hosted an orchestra and a theater at his magnificent palace of Romanov, Romanif, in Podolia, though it was on a, an unusually large scale. We could easily draw the story of musical life at Romanov into a national narrative of Polish music history especially as the eminent Polish composer Ignacy Dobzinski, a classmate of Chopin in Warsaw, was born and brought up in the palace, where his father directed the orchestra. But I want to tell a different story, a transnational story. When Kontilinski invited two Italian impresarios, Giuseppe Zamboni and Giovanni Mantovani, to bring a troupe to Romanov, performances of Italian opera at the Palace Theatre began to attract wider interest. And among those expressing an interest was the governor of Odessa, the Duke de Richelieu, the so-called Odessa Richelieu. Odessa here, just here, was at that time a brand new town, the jewel of Novorossiya, meaning those new Russian territories that were just then being Europeanized, quite literally so, in that European colonies were being transplanted there. Now, the agenda was to make Odessa a kind of St. Petersburg of the South, and Richelieu's plans for the city included the construction of a grand theater. It was completed in 1810, and in the autumn of 1811, he persuaded Zamboni and Mantovani to leave Romanov and to bring a troop to Odessa. Between them, the two Italians uh, organized, uh, responsible for productions at the theater there for the whole of the next decade with annually renewable contracts and with a small subsidy uh, provided by the town Duma. They moved on to Moscow in the early 1820s but by then, the tradition of Italian opera had been firmly established in Odessa. Pushkin tells us how he frequented this elegant stone theater, his words, right next to his accommodation, and how Italian opera restored his soul, at least until his rather public indiscretions with the new governor's wife led to his departure from the city. When Zamboni and Mantovani left, there were several short-term contracts with other troops, but in 1832, the Julienne troop was uh, contracted and maintained a presence at the theater until 1838. Its programming was more or less conformant with wider processes of canon formation in Italian opera. Uh, you may not be able to see this, but uh, 
these, this is a list of new productions in the 30s, and if you can see it, you'll, you'll see that Bellini and Donizetti are riding high. Note also the little-known composer Luigi Ricci here. He actually took over as director of the theatre in 1844. Uh, there's a bit of an intriguing might have been here because that job was offered to Donizetti and he accepted it before something a bit more lucrative came his way in Milan. Anyway, it was at Ricci's instigation that the Julienne troupe returned, staying until 1850, and this, of course, is when Verdi's star was in the ascendant. But I want to emphasize <coughs> mobility and networking. The Odessa Theatre had close connections with Naples and Bologna, and also with Moscow and St. Petersburg. But there was also local networking. It was typical that close links were established between the theatres of Odessa on the littoral, here, and Yash in the interior, the Moldavian, Moldavian capital Yash. Singers would travel from one theater to the other. Bear in mind that Moldavia and Wallachia had not yet been unified, um, and that Moldavia had extensive cultural commerce with Novorossiya. The distance between these two cities was not all that great. The Yash papers at the time were full of Odessa. So it was perhaps not surprising that in 1846, when the National Theatre in Yash was moved into permanent accommodation in the Sturza Palace, that it was an offshoot of the Julienne troupe that was invited there for the season. In this way, Italian opera became firmly established in the Moldavian capital too. Let's travel now to the eastern hinterland of the Black Sea and to Tbilisi in Georgia, way over here. Again, there is a connection with Odessa. I mentioned earlier Pushkin's indiscretions with the new governor's wife in Odessa. Well, that governor was Prince Mikhail Semyonovich Vorontsov, one of the really big names in the political history of the <coughs> empire in the early 19th century. Now, Vorontsov, too, had learned to love Italian opera in Odessa. And when he was posted to Tbilisi, the Russians called it Tiflis, as governor general of the Caucasus in 1844, he lost no time in planning a new theater. He brought with him from Odessa the Italian architect Giovanni Scudieri, who was charged with modernizing the city and with designing the new theater. It was he who named it the Caravanserai Theater, and you can see its splendidly oriental interior here. When it was complete, the Barbieri troupe, which was just then touring in southern Russia, was invited for the opening season. I make that sound easy, but a story could be told about the hazards of travel at this time. We know that the troupe almost turned back, so arduous was their journey across the greater Caucasus mountain range. This is higher than anything in the European Alps, by the way. And they would have needed passports but not in the modern sense. If you were not aristocracy, permission was required if you traveled beyond your local region in the Russian Empire, and within the empire, individual cities would have had their own requirements. It really wasn't to do with nations. Anyway, the troupe made it in the end, and the theater was formally opened with a production of Lucia di Lamo Moore in 1851. One of those in the audience was Leo Tolstoy. He writes about it. It would be the beginning of a love affair between Tbilisi and Italian opera that continues to this day. Now we jump forward two decades. In 1871, we find that same Barbieri in Smyrna, present-day Izmir, down here. He's the musical director now of the newly built Teatro de Smyrna. This is its interior, which was modeled actually on the plans for the Palais Garnier, which was being constructed at just at that time. Now, of course, we're in Ottoman territory. Yet although Smyrna was a leading Ottoman city, it hosted a European culture whose roots lay deep. 
with French and Italian opera troops a fairly continuous presence from the mid-19th century onwards. And by the way, Barbieri would have needed a special passport to enter Ottoman territory and a further passport for Smyrna, though we're still not really in the era of passports in the modern sense. All this is part of a bigger story about European culture in the Ottoman Empire. I won't tell that story, except to say that Giuseppe Donizetti, brother of the composer and the better paid of the two, was based in Istanbul for most of his life. And under his leadership, Istanbul, of course, as you certainly know, is just uh, up the coast. Uh, <coughs> under his leadership, Western music was taught and eminent musicians were invited to the court. You can still see Liszt's apartment there when he was giving concerts at the, the Ottoman court. Italian opera was hosted by the Narm Theatre, uh, which had been established in Istanbul as early as 1841 and was very soon incorporated within the well-networked circuits of Eastern Mediterranean and Southern Russian opera troops. It attracted some of the most famous singers of the day. And even when the theater burned down in 1870, Italian opera continued to thrive in the city. Gas lighting uh, wreaked havoc with theaters at this time. Two years later, the Odessa Theatre burned down, and the Tbilisi Theatre a year after that. A decade later, the Yash Theatre had gone too. I wish there was time to tell you about their rebuilding. I'll mention only Tbilisi, where the oriental theme of the first theatre was extended by its remarkable replacement still there today. It's just had a makeover, actually, um, and it looks quite fantastic. I've been discussing here one small corner of a very large field. Opera troops sourced from German cities, from Moscow and St. Petersburg, and of course from Italy, traversed the whole of Central Europe, extending to the Romanian principalities and beyond. They took in the cities of the Adriatic, literal, reaching down to the Ionian Islands, though there was also, of course, direct travel there from Italy. And as shipping lanes expanded, they circumnavigated the Black Sea, from the cities of Navarrosia to those of Anatolia. As they did so, they spread a common culture, predominantly Italian opera, and bequeathed it to successor states. The point I'm trying to make is that to enfold this mobile operatic culture within a series of national histories cuts right against the grain of its true nature. Yet that's more or less what happened. A case in point would be Octavian Cosma's monumental chronicle of Romanian music. Well, a chronicle isn't a history, of course, uh, but uh, Cosma had already written a history of Romanian opera, and the, there the distortion is transparent. Transnational operatic networking underplayed, the vernacular turn in opera overplayed, as emblematic of an emergent national style. Note the date, 1962. Um, nothing coming out of Bucharest at that time could be ideology free. For my third category, commonalities arising from nationalist agendas in compositional practice, I'd like to stay with Istanbul for a moment. The Turkish language operas of Tigran Chukhatsian, especially his opera Zemir, are considered a formative part of Turkish music history. This is not wrong, but it's not the whole story. Ask any informed Armenian, and they will identify Chukhatsian as the composer of the first Armenian national opera, Arshak II. Now, in his later years, Chukhatsian moved from Istanbul to Smyrna. We're back to Smyrna. And while there, he overlapped with a young composer called Manolis Kalomiris. Kalomiris was brought up in Ottoman Smyrna, and he later studied in Istanbul. But as you will be aware, he's known today as the eminence grise of the Greek national school. The Master Builder and Mother's Ring are his first two operas. A few years after he left Smyrna, 
Adnan Ahmed Saigun was born in the city. Saigun was primus inter pares of the uh, pioneering Turkish Five, so-called, the uh, represented the kind of coming of age of uh, European music in Turkey. And he made his mark notably with his first opera, Ajoy, whose plot, incidentally, was dictated by Ataturk himself. So one city, three composers, four national narratives. Many of you will know that Smyrna's days as a multinational city came to a dramatic end in 1922. The events of that year were known by Kalomirus and all Greeks as the catastrophe, and by Saigun and all Turks as the liberation. And that binarism tells us that we are already in an era of nation states. In his monumental book, The Transformation of the World, Jürgen Osterhammel cautions against prematurity in discussing national identities in the 19th century. But even he concedes that the events of Smyrna marked the definitive end of an era, even if what was lost may not have been quite the paradise of Giles Milton's title. After Smyrna, both Kalomiris and Saigun would have needed a passport, and one that we would recognize today. Just two years before the sacking of Smyrna, the modern passport system was formalized in Paris at an international passport conference organized by the League of Nations. The clearest of signals that nation states were now the status quo, empires the status quo ante. The passport was now the primary symbol of acceptance within the collectivity of the nation state. In his refugee conversations, Bertolt Brecht gave it an almost existential importance. The new musical nationalisms of the Eastern Mediterranean were characterized by what one reviewer of Tchukhatsi and Zemir described as a magical mixture of European art and Oriental taste. And this was to become a leitmotif. In his manifesto of 1908, Kalomiris referred to the Greek Oriental color to which his national school should aspire. His opera Mother's Ring is emblematic. As to Saigun, his first opera, Ashoy, is infused with the Oriental features you might expect to find in an opera based on an ancient Persian epic. The Hungarian musician Irena Savax referred to a mixture of two cultures, a fitting enough description for a composer who studied oud as well as piano, makam as well as European harmony. In short, an oriental component was deemed integral to the formation of national styles in this region. I mean, of course, a West Asian Levantine orient. This raises a question that I leave a bit open for the moment, is there actually any difference in purely musical terms between indigenous appropriations of oriental elements and those portrayals of a fabled other, the singing Turk of Mozart and Rossini, famously deconstructed in discourses of orientalism? I'm going to approach that question uh, implausibly enough by way of a brief excursus on today's popular music. I've talked a bit about European art music in the Ottoman world, but influence flowed in the other direction too. In particular, the Ottoman Fazil suite left its imprint on popular and semi-classical urban musics right across Southeast Europe in the early 20th century. You can see some of the principal genres here. To compress the history drastically, these urban traditions then left their own homogenizing mark on the neo-folk that emerged in the region in the 1960s, and that in turn influenced present-day ethno-pop. One of Donna Buchanan's informants uh, remarked in the early 2000s that a common Balkan music is emerging, where you can't tell whether it's Serbian, Bulgarian, Greek, Albanian, or Turkish. Generic labels differ, some of the main ones are listed there, but the musical materials flow freely across the boundaries. Now, it might seem tempting to think of the oriental signifiers in ethnopop 
as a way of reinscribing an Ottoman inheritance into Balkan identities, bearing in mind that discourses of Balkanism often equate the term Balkan with Ottoman presence and legacy in Europe, I think especially of Todorova's uh, seminal book. But that doesn't quite cover it. The nature of the Oriental elements suggests that more conventionally Orientalist glamorizing or self-exoticizing modes were also at work, again signaling the ambivalence between an indigenous East and a mythicized East. I'm going to try and illustrate that ambivalence by playing you just two brief snippets of generic ethnopop. The first from Serbian turbo folk, <coughs> the other from Albanian musica popolore. In both cases, the music glitters with MTV stardust, but if you're suitably informed, you may just detect the greatly emaciated trace of a Taksim Pejref sequence from the Ottoman Fazil. <laughs> Not the Albanian one, whoops. And it's obvious, I think, that the Oriental <coughs> figures in those extracts do indeed function as all-purpose signifiers that inflect a common aesthetic center. But actually, the main point of this little excursus is to indicate that 19th century musical nationalism <coughs> and art music works in exactly the same way. Um, uh, here, too, the nation presents a variant on a uniform contemporary idiom. In Central and Eastern Europe, highly generalized folk markers, Lydian mode, Bourdon fifths, dance rhythm, certain types of ornamentation, served as inclusive signifiers of the nation, while specificity resided in a poetics of intention and reception. This is a story that began with Chopin, uh, proceeded through the late 19th century Russians, and culminated in a cluster of national traditions at the turn of the century. 19th century national styles, in short, exhibited a notable homogeneity. When Southeast Europe joined the party, a few other generic markers were added in, most notably ornamental melismata and the hijaz tetrachord, with its characteristic augmented second, or if you're coming from another place, the plagal second ecos of Byzantine chant. Almost the same, actually. These are classic markers of Oriental music and they are found in our three operas, Tuchatsi and Zemir, Kalomiris, Mother's Ring, and Saigun's Ashok. The paradox here is that three composers who themselves inhabited a space 
that they placed on a local continuum with Europe uh, uh, invoked that space with signifiers of a European other. I should probably confess to you that Richard Taruskin has accused me in print of finding paradoxes absolutely everywhere. But hey, he's not here. So I can offer you a second paradox, and one that really does encapsulate my third category, commonalities arising from nationalism in compositional practice. It's this. Markers designed to singularize national traditions, far from generating multiple divergent cultures, succeeded only in generating a unitary convergent culture. My fourth and final category concerns commonalities arising from the lure of modern Europe. In Southeast Europe, the impulse to modernize not only crossed national boundaries, but was actually viewed, at least initially, as directly oppositional to the quest for national styles. This resulted in a major polemic in the interwar years. There was, for example, an extended exchange between two leading composers across several issues of the Yugoslav journal Zvuk, based in Belgrade. Yugoslavia was then a new state. This is the first Yugoslavia. And the question was what it might reasonably expect of music. For the Croatian composer Anton Dobronitz, the imperative was to invest in the nation, meaning a conservative-leaning idiom based on appropriations of South Slav folk music. Many followed his lead. For the Slovenian composer Slavko Osterts, on the other hand, these composers lacked what he called the will to export. For him, the imperative for Yugoslav music was to invest in the new, meaning a modernist cosmopolitan idiom. He too had his cohort, all signed up members of the ISCM and all embracing contemporary techniques. Their models included Hindemith, Schoenberg and Haber, and also Bela Bartok. Actually, Bartok had special significance for modernists right across Southeast Europe, as he demonstrated that, that there could be a middle way in this polemic. His lesson was that composers could draw upon traditional music in the spirit of modernism as well as romantic nationalism. Instead of using generalized signifiers of the kind I described earlier, Bartok dug deep into the structures of pre-modern agrarian musics and allowed those structures to generate modernist systems. It didn't much matter if his source was Hungarian, Romanian, Turkish, or North African. What really counted was that it was a pre-modern music that had been bypassed by the progressive rationality spearheading European art music. When appropriated by art music, it could then acquire critical acumen. It could function, in short, as both a critical tool and a regenerative medium. Now, some of the most significant music to emerge from Southeast Europe was composed in precisely this spirit, in some cases independently of Bartok, in other cases under his direct influence. I think of Georgenescu from the early 1920s onwards. I think of Josip Slavinsky, who studied in Budapest and transcribed field notes for Bartok. And I think of the later music of Adnan Ahmed Saigun, who acted as Bartok's official guide during his fieldwork in Turkey. We left Saigun with a reference to the Orientalisms of his first opera, Ashoy, which I linked to those of Chukhatsian and Kalomiris. Well, subsequent to composing Ashoy, Saigun's approach to indigenous music changed, and this undoubtedly reflected his direct contact with Bartok. I'll illustrate this with a single short example. Recently, I've been collaborating in an analytical project on Saigun with Turev Berki and Izmit Karadenis from the Hachetepe University in Ankara. In the course of this project, we demonstrate how equally tempered abstractions of Turkish makams generate modernist systems. I don't think this is an occasion to get heavily analytical but I will at least show you an example and ask you to take the details on trust. This is an equally tempered abstraction of 
Makambestini Ga, which Saigun regularly used in teaching. These are derived sets. And this is part of one of the preludes on Aksak rhythms, uh, showing how the sets generate a unity of musical space, embracing both an harmonic field and related motivic cells. I remind you of the question I left open earlier about the ambivalent status of oriental elements. There is, I suggest, a step change between the generalized signifiers found in Ashoi and modernist system building of this kind designed to bridge an Eastern Makam tradition and European modernity. By ending this lecture with Zaigun's synthesis, I point very synoptically, I'm afraid, to a yet bigger story. I'll sketch it briefly as a kind of coda, and here I'm really kind of opening out rather wildly. Um, Saigun's music can, of course, be viewed in the framework of the Turkish nationalism advocated by Jia Gyokol, Kemal Atatürk's primary ideologue. But note that Gyokol's book, Principles of Turkism, was informed by the wider movement known as Turanism. This embraced the Turkic peoples of Central Asia and beyond, and for some, it also included Finns, Hungarians, Mongolians, and other so-called Uralo-Altaic peoples. Turanism purported to consolidate a culturally and linguistically unified power base as a counterweight to Europe and the West. But although it invested in ancient Turkic culture and sought to restore its historical agency, it was also a modernizing movement and drew heavily on contemporary European thought. Gyokol himself <laughs> steered a very careful course between a spiritually informed collectivism and modern understandings of the nation state. Interestingly, when we turn to our other east, to post-imperial Russia, we find a parallel and broadly similar movement, albeit necessarily developed uh, by uh, an intelligentsia in exile. This was Eurasianism born of the conviction that the Eastern Slavonic world embodied spiritual values and reparative energies that a decadent and over-refined Europe had long since lost. The new Russia should ideally be neither Europe nor Asia, according to the key players, but a third thing, namely Eurasia. The values of traditional orthodoxy were extolled, as was a mythical Scythian past. Yet exactly like Yokol, these men, or some of them, sought to draw this restorative nostalgia into the orbit of European modernity. They saw modernity as a necessary advance from reified Asian cultures, but at the same time they were anxious to assert their distinctiveness from Europe. <coughs> Turanism and Eurasianism were two major outcomes of a political and cultural quest for supranational identities that began almost as soon as nation states were forged from <coughs> empires, and both have had a new lease of life since the 1990s, usually prefixed by neo, neo turanism neo-Eurasianism. We could, of course, add a third, bringing us much closer to home. On the face of it, the European Union is, or perhaps was, the the real success story in the quest for supranational identities. And Dublin seems the right venue to paraphrase a journalistic piece by Colm Torbin on just what constituted that success. For Torbin, the real achievements of this loose and uneasy collection of competing nation states are to be found less on the political than on the cultural level. Europe's major cities, Tobin argued, embody the unifying triumph of humanism, of economic success, of tolerance, of international law, and of cosmopolitan reason, transcending the corruption of petty officialdom, the idiocies of bureaucracy, and even the anarchy uh, of generated by overdeveloped systems. 
Through its cultural achievements, the EU has been, he suggested here, a civilizing influence in the world. A decade has passed since Torbin wrote that article, and during that decade, an increasingly divisive political nationalism has threatened to undermine those cultural achievements, something Tobin himself has actually registered in more recent essays. In some quarters, this has extended to not just the manipulation, but the rewriting of cultural history. And as it happens, I've watched this up close in Poland under the direction of the current Minister of Culture, Piotr Gliński. Um, and to make matters worse, in my younger days studying in Poland, he was a very close <coughs> friend. Of course, there's nothing new in this. The propaganda value of imaginative culture has been recognized by politicians at least since the time of Nina Weg. But the very least we can do as cultural historians is to refrain from providing further ammunition. I'm almost there. In his controversial but important book, The Invention of the Jewish People, Shlomo Sand set out to undermine the claims of Zionist historiography as to the ethnic integrity of the Jews. His mission was to question their status as a people. Now, it goes without saying that Jewish history exemplifies, indeed epitomizes, a pedigree tension between the politics of ethnos and the politics of demos. However, in issuing such a defiant challenge to ethnos, and note that it's a challenge from within, Sand reached far beyond the particulars of his own study. At one point, he makes his wider agenda explicit. How might we denationalize national histories, was his question. It's an obvious prompt for my own question, how might we denationalize music histories? Thank you very much indeed for listening. <laughs>